Hello and welcome to this session. This is Professor Farhad. In this session, we would look at asset classes, specifically the fixed income class. This topic is covered in a CP on the CPA exam as well as the CFA exam. Also covered in an essentials of investment, whether it's an undergraduate or graduate course. As always, I would like to remind you to connect with me on LinkedIn if you haven't done so. YouTube is where you would need to subscribe. I have 1,700 plus accounting, auditing, tax, finance, and Excel tutorial. If you like my lectures, please like them, share them, subscribe to the channel, share them with other people. If they benefit you, it means they might benefit them. Share the wealth, connect with me on Instagram. On my website, farhatlectures.com, I have a catalog of various accounting and finance courses that will help you substantially, whether you are taking finance or accounting courses, or if you are studying for your CPA exam. So for, from a grand perspective, we have three types of asset classes. We have fixed income, we have equity, and we have derivatives. So in this, in this series of recording, I'm going to be focusing on these three type of classes. And today we're going to be working on the fixed income, which can be broken down into money market and capital market. And specifically for, for this session, I'll be focusing on the money market. The money market is short term market short term in nature short term means it's going to be cashed out in the near future so what is the money market the money market is a subsector of the fixed income market fixed income market means you will be getting the same amount of money from your investment so it doesn't vary it's fixed so when you lend money you would receive interest payment generally speaking that interest payment is fixed however once you say money market think of short term it's a short term investment it's liquid it's liquid means it can be easily converted to cash so if you want your cash you can sell it and get your cash and another feature of the money market it's low risk low risk means it's not going to change that easily and the reason it's not going to change that easily part of it it's it's short term and liquid so those two together if something is short term and liquid it means you can sell it quickly and you can sell it in the near future the near future should not carry that much risk relative to the long term perspective so that's why it has a low risk it means the risk of defaulting is low in other words the risk of not getting your money often those market uh, trade in large denomination but we're going to look at various types of them and this is a list of them we're going to look at treasury bills which is considered the only risk-free cd certificate of deposits commercial papers we'll talk about lehman brothers bankers acceptance we use in international trade euro dollars repos and reserve again we'll talk about lehman when we talk about repos and reserve the federal fund the borrowing between the banks most of these instruments are sold at a discount what does discount mean it means it's below the value so when when someone sells you a treasury bill let's i'm just going to give you a quick example they may sell it to you for ten thousand okay but the face value is ten thousand the difference between what they sell it for you for you now and the face value is a thousand and that's the interest that you earn on that bill because you purchase it for a nine when it matures it matures at ten and we'll look at a real example in a moment so let's look at specifically treasury bills what is treasury bills sometimes they're called t-bills sometimes just called bills uh, for short but they're highly liquid highly liquid means they can be easily traded why Look, listen, listen, listen to me why because it's the, the United States government okay most the, it's the most marketable of all money market instrument why because the US government raises money by selling those papers so when the US government when Uncle Sam from Washington wants to borrow money from the market they sell you those those t-bills those treasury bond those treasury bond so investors buy the bill at a discount from the stated maturity rate so when the government sells it to you they say okay if this is a ten thousand dollar if this is a ten thousand dollar bond look it's printed on a ten thousand only give us nine thousand eight hundred and guess what when you come back when it matures we'll give you ten thousand dollars so it's sold at a discount okay the nine thousand eight hundred is the discount Okay, so as the bill as the bill reaches maturity, the government pay the investor the full amount or the face value. The face value again is ten thousand. It's printed on the bill, and those bills comes in different maturities. Whether it's four weeks, thirteen weeks, twenty six, twenty six, or fifty two. Simply put, fifty two weeks is is a year. So they 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 come in less than a year 
a maturity value. So individual can purchase these treasury bill right from the government, or they can, they can buy it from the secondary market from the government dealer. And those securities, unlike other money market instruments that we will see later that they that they sell with a minimum of 100,000 because they target large corporation, T-bill, they sell in the minimum of only 100, but 10,000 is a very common denomination. But simply put, anyone can lend money to the government as long as they buy those T-bill. And by the way, those T-bills are taxable at the federal level, but they're exempt from the local and state level. Let's take a look at how they trade. So let's take a look at this bill, October 12, 2017. This is the maturity date. Days to mature is 177 days. The bid is 0.905. The ask is 0.809. It's changed from the prior day, and this is the yield. So how do we read this uh, treasury bill? So, so the, the bill obviously maturing October 2nd, 2017, and we are 177 days before this date. So we have to count back 177 days, which is October 18th, 2017. So they tell you how many days it's still to mature. Now, why is this important? Because if you buy this bill, if you buy it, you're going to be earning interest for the next 177 days because from the time you buy it, the interest will start. So the yield under the column asked is given as 0.895. What does that mean? It means that the dealer was willing to sell you the bill at a discount from the face value. So the price of it is 0.895 times the amount it's going to take until it matures. So you'll take the price, they will sell it to you at this price, times the time it's going to mature. So it's yielding 0.4410. So a bill with a 10,000 face value could be purchased, sold to you at 10,000 minus 0.0044, which this is what it's going to earn. So they will sell it to you today for 9,956. 9, 9, That's what they sell it to you for. The same thing could be said if they want to buy it. Uh, sim similarly, on the basis of the base yield of 0.95, Okay, this is what they, they would buy it. A dealer would be willing to purchase the bill from you if they want to purchase it. They'll purchase it for a kind of a dollar less or 50 cent less because if they want to buy it, they're going to say, okay, we'll buy it from you, but it's 50, 50 cent less. Notice they will buy it. And how do you find this price? It's 10,000 times 1 minus 0 0.0095 times 177 divided by 360. And prices are yet are inversely related. We'll talk about this a little bit more when we look at bonds. So this implies a lower bid price. CDs are another form of short-term borrowing. Basically, what is a CD? Is when you deposit your money at the bank and you lock that amount. You lock it for a, for a period of time. So you cannot take it, withdraw it on demand anytime you want to. You cannot go into the ATM machine and take it out. And here when we talk about CDs, certificate of deposits, those are large certificate of deposit, okay? We're not talking about 10,000, we're talking 100,000 and above. The bank pays interest and the principal to the depositor at the end of the fixed term of the CD, and this is what a CD is. Those CDs are usually issued in a denomination larger than 100,000 and are usually negotiable. What does negotiable mean? It means if you carry one of those CDs, you can sell it to someone else if you want your money. That's the nature of the money market. It's short-term liquid. Short-term means it's gonna mature soon and there's a market for you to sell it. Now the market for the CDs is not as liquid. It means it's not doesn't have a lot of buyers and sellers as much as other ones. Nevertheless, it is liquid. It can be sold to another investor if the owner needs the cash and the certificate before it matures. It's marketable. However, there's a thin out for maturity. Market significantly thin outs for maturities of three months or more. So it's marketable when the when the maturity is less than three months. This is when it really becomes very much uh, very very marketable. See, these are treated as bank deposits by the Federal uh, Deposit Insurance Corporation (FDIC). It means that CD, a uh, you know, you could have up to 250,000, any, anything more than that and your losses, we cannot guarantee it. So the CDs are considered part of your savings account, basically, or your checking account. Another form of uh, money market is commercial papers or for short CP. And Lehman was notorious for this. And we're going to talk about this a little bit more. 
Those are short-term and secure debt issued by large corporation. So a company like Microsoft or Apple or Amazon, they need money in the, in the short term. So what they do is they issue those commercial papers. So they give you a commercial paper saying, I want to borrow a million dollar. They, you will give them 990,000 and they'll give you a piece of paper saying, we're gonna pay you back a million dollar two weeks from now. They're sort of short-term, unsecured. Now, the well-known companies often issue those unsecured paper because they have to be well known, they have to have a good credit. Sometimes um, commercial paper is backed by the line of credit. It means if you don't pay it, you could use your bank account and your bank account will pay for it. They mature in up to 270 days. Most of them are less than 60 days. Most of, most of them are really short. They come in 100,000 denomination. Okay, so 100, 200, 300, they usually trade in millions because corporation needs large amount of money. Small investors can invest in those through money market funds. So some money market fund, even if you have $5,000, you can buy commercial paper, but you will buy a piece of it. Commercial paper are safe because of its short term nature. Well, when we say safe, because some of them were not safe, but let's put safe in quote. And the reason it's safe, because every time something is short term, it's safe. So their sensitivity, uh, they're, they're, they're traded in the secondary market. It means they are quite liquid. They can be sold and bought anytime you want to. And they are rated. Rated means, for example, when Microsoft wants to issue those commercial paper, Microsoft is AAA rated by one of the agencies like Standard and Porters. So they're rated, they give security, they, they give confidence to buyers and sellers. And the yield on the commercial paper depends on the time of the maturity and the credit rating. Obviously, the longer the maturity, the more the company will have to pay. And the lower the credit rating, the lower the credit ratings, they, the more they have to pay. So if you have AAA, you might pay 2%. If you have double A, you might have to pay 2.5. If you have an A rating, you might have to pay 3% to raise money because your rating goes down. And the longer you want, to, uh, the, 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 the longer you're borrowing, the more you have to pay. The yield, yeah, the yield is depending on the maturity and the credit rating. Historically, those papers were issued by non-financial firms, simply put, non-banks. But what happened in the years leading to the financial crisis, and I talked about this in the prior session, there was a sharp increase in the so-called asset-backed commercial paper. So what companies started to do, like Lehman Brothers, what they started to do, they started to borrow money using, using their assets for the commercial paper. But guess what? Their asset was no good. Their asset was, I'm sorry to say this, was crappy. So it was issued by non, 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 by financial firms such as bank. The short-term commercial paper was used to raise funds from the issuing firm to invest in other assets, mostly notoriously subprime mortgage. What they say is, give us the money. We need to take this money and buy subprime mortgage. Mortgage is long-term. Commercial paper is short-term. So what you're doing is you are borrowing money on a short-term basis to buy asset on a long-term basis. So these assets were in turn used as collateral, those long-term assets, and that's why it's called asset back, which is very risky business. By 2007, those subprime mortgage began defaulting. The bank found themselves unable to issue new commercial paper to refinance their position as the old paper mature. And what happened to this commercial, mar commercial paper market when Lehman went down? It, it infected all the other commercial paper and everybody was scared of dealing with commercial paper. So everybody started to withdraw their money. And I talked about this in the prior, in some other prior session in this course. Everybody took their money and put it in treasury bill and the commercial paper collapsed and the commercial paper is needed for corporation to raise money. So it was a big deal. Another form of uh, a short-term short money market is banker's acceptance. And banker acceptance is used when a company is importing and exporting, basically international trade, buying from overseas customers. Basically, it's an order to a bank by a customer to pay some amount of money at a future date. So simply put, if you have a banker acceptance, it means the bank is guaranteeing a payment for you. So when you want to buy from China, if you want to import something from China, the Chinese the Chinese firm doesn't know who you are, so how would they trust you? The bank would say, look, I will. I have a banker's acceptance. I will guarantee this, this individual or this firm, okay? So typically it's within six months because the bank doesn't wanna take any longer chance on you. 
uh, like a post data check. Basically, you give them a post data check, guarantee that the bank will honor that check. Once the bank endorses, once the bank honors the order of payment as accepted, it assumes responsibility for the ultimate payment. So the bank use so, do so. And once that happens, the instrument becomes negotiable. It means whoever holds that instrument, they can sell it in the secondary market for something. So if if the person in China doesn't want to wait to wait for you to pay them the money, they can sell it in the secondary market. So the banker acceptance are considered very safe because basically the bank guarantee them, obviously. So as they allow traders to substitute bank credit standing of the, for their own. So this simply put, it's a guarantee by a bank that you they will make the payment, okay? They are used widely in foreign trade, as I told you, where the credit worthiness of one trader is unknown to the other partner. Acceptance sells at a discount, just like the T-bill. When, when you have it, it sells at a discount. Euro dollars, uh, this is the biggest misnomer. Euro dollars has nothing to do with Euro. It's dollar de denominated deposit, so it's US dollar. It's not Euro, it's not Euros. It's actual US dollar deposited in foreign banks. And those deposits escape the regulation by the Federal Reserve because in Euro because they're in, in some other country. And the tag Euro, it's not really, they, they don't have to be Europe. They can be in Asia, they can be in South Africa, they can be in South America, they're still considered Euro dollar because it started deposits in Europe, but it's all over the place, but that tag continued. So uh, most Euro dollars are large sums of money by corporation, and most of the time they are CDs less than six months in maturity. Then we have something called Euro dollar certificate of deposit, which is kind of, a domestic bank CD, but it's in, in a foreign country. It's it's liability of a non-US branch of a bank, typically a London, basically holds the liability for those. And we have also the Euro bonds or Euro dollar bonds. It's either firms or countries, they try to borrow money on a long-term basis. So Euro bonds are not money market. They're basically part of the bonds market, but nevertheless, we just wanna make sure that you don't you differentiate between Euro dollars, Euro certificate, and euro bonds because they all carry the term euro. So euro bonds are bonds issued in US dollar, but they are sold overseas. Another type of money market is repos and reserve. Again, Lehman Brothers was notorious for using this, this, uh, this type of uh, short-term money market instrument. Their short-term sales of securities with an agreement to repurchase the securities at a higher rate. So simply put, what happened is Lehman will have some asset usually mortgage-backed security. And what they do, let's assume they have a million of million dollars of them, they want they want money right away. They want 980,000. So what they do is they transfer this, this mortgage-backed securities to a lender and the lender will give them back 980,000. Lehman would give them mortgage-backed securities worth a million. Okay, so this is the lender, the other party. And what happened, Lehman, a week later, Lehman will go back and say, okay, we're gonna give you back the million, give us back our securities. And the lender basically made 20,000 because you know, the, the lender only gave them 980. This is what a repo is. So I would sell it to you that I will buy it back at a higher price. And the lender have no problem with that because, because they're giving you the mortgage backed securities. They've given you assets. They're giving you some security. The problem with Lehman is those securities were no good. And once they, they were discovered, they were no, they were no good. Also, the, the repo market froze because everybody was feared that they might have toxic asset. They're, they're holding toxic assets. Asset. So dealers and government securities use repurchase agreement, also called repo, as a form of short-term borrowing, overnight borrowing. Usually it can be overnight, it can be you know, for a few days. So if, you, if you're a dealer in government securities, basically buying and selling government securities, you could use those securities to raise cash, okay? The dealer sells the securities to an investor as, a, as an overnight basis when the agreement to buy back those securities the next day at a higher rate. So if, if somebody needs a loan for a million dollar, it's okay, I'll give you 990,000 today, give me those securities tomorrow, buy it back from me for a million. So that's the difference is my interest. The increase in the price is the overnight interest. The difference is the overnight interest. The dealer thus takes out one day loan from the investor. The securities serve as a collateral. So you give them the you give them the, the bonds that you have and you get the money. Tomorrow, the following day, you give them back the money that they gave you plus a little bit of interest and they'll give you back the bonds. 
so repos are considered very safe again unless you are you are dealing with with lehman in terms of credit risk because the loans are literally overnight or close to overnight and they are securitized so you're lending lending me the money for one or two days or a week i should exist within one week and i'm giving you some assets and that, but that's not what happened with lehman it was crazy time the lehman's the assets were no good and Lehman did not survive. We also have what's called reserve, re reverse, which is the op opposite of a, re of a repo. A reverse is a mirror image of a repo where the dealer find an investor, now it's the other way around, holding, holding government securities and buy them with an agreement to resell them. So now the dealer is buying the securities rather than needing of the cash. It's the opposite of a repo. A broker's call um, if you never watched that movie margin call you should watch that movie what happened is when you have a brokerage account let's assume you have for the sake of illustration you have uh, thirty thousand dollar in that account well guess what you have thirty thousand then the broker will give you another thirty thousand so now you have a power a purchasing power of sixty thousand to buy securities What's happening now is you are buying on margin. Now this additional thirty thousand, the brokers buy it. The brokers get it from the bank. Okay, so individual who buy stocks on margin, uh, borrow part of the funds to pay, to pay stocks from their broker. Now the broker in terms may borrow the funds from a bank, and that's why when we have liquidity in the market, the federal the Federal Reserve gives money to the bank. The bank lend it to the brokers. The brokers lend it to the investors. We have a lot of liquidity. The stock prices goes up. So when you say, well, the stock prices go up because of liquidity, because the banks and the federal system are dumping money into our stock market. So agreeing to repay the bank immediately on call if the bank requested. So the broker will say, look, if you want the money, I can get, get you the money anytime on call. And there's that movie called Margin Call. You should watch it if you're interested in the stock market. So the rate paid on such loans are usually about a percentage above the treasury bill. So usually whatever the treasury bill is, then they will charge you another percentage. Let's talk about the federal funds. This is we're dealing with the Federal Reserve. This is the funds and the account of commercial bank at the Federal Reserve. So every bank, when they accept the deposit let's assume they accept a one hundred thousand dollar deposit they they have to put some money let's assume ten thousand dollar of this deposit in the federal reserve that's why they have to put that money so it's bank maintain a deposit of their own at the fed for example here ten thousand of the hundred thousand dollar each member of the federal reserve system is required to maintain a minimum balance and that minimum balance depends on the total of deposit of the bank's customer so it depends also on the on the federal reserve that you are dealing with at any time some bank might have more funds than required by the fed so if you have more money you might have to increase your fund if you have less money and you have more money and at the federal reserve then you have access fund so what do you do with that access fund well banks with access fund can lend those to those to a bank with a shortage so let's assume let's go back and you have a million dollar worth of deposits and you already have at the federal reserve a hundred thousand today a lot of people withdrew money and you have eight hundred thousand of deposits well guess what your deposit should your fed you should only deposit not one hundred eighty thousand at the bank so you have access of twenty thousand now a bank will have the another bank might have the opposite a bank might have a million and hundred thousand but suddenly they have more deposits but they don't have enough money to put it away at the federal reserve therefore they will borrow that extra twenty thousand from you overnight so this way they are covered at the federal reserve now the interest rate that they that these banks charge each other is called the fed fund rate okay it's simply the rate of interest on the very short-term loans among financial institution and those loans are literally overnight until the next day that bank wired money to the federal reserve and they'll pay you back your loan while most investors cannot participate in this market the fed fund rate command great interest as a key barometer of the monetary policy usually this fed fund rate drives every other interest rate in the private market something similar to the fed fund rate is the libor and the LIBOR stand for the London Offering Interbank Rate. Uh, this is the lending rate among banks in the London market. Here we're talking about European, mainly the British. It's the pre premier short-term interest rate quoted in the European money market and serve as a reference rate for a wide range of transaction. It reflects the rate at which bank lend among each other. You remember we talked about the Fed fund rate? 
the US bank lend amongst each other. Now LIBOR is the European bank lending among, among each other. Also, when banks make loans out, what they do is they would say, we're gonna charge you LIBOR, whatever LIBOR is plus 2%. Now there is a big, a big scandal about this. It's beyond the scope of this course, or I don't, you know, I'm not gonna discuss it in this recording. Um, so LIBOR is kind of gonna be phased out shortly. Okay, so hundreds of trillions of dollars, mortgages, loans, and derivatives contract are based on LIBOR. So LIBOR is very important. We have also Eurobor, which is the European interbank offer rate, and we have TIBOR, the Tokyo interbank offer rate, are quoted in terms ranging for, from overnight to several months of interest rate. So the, those are also kind of benchmarks. They're all based on surveys, basically. And this is what happened with LIBOR. The surveys were were, were monkeyed with of rates reported. So you notice it's reported by participating bank rather than actual transaction. So the, what the banks were reported and the actual rate, they were not the same. And this is the problem with LIBOR. The British regulators have reports phasing out LIBOR by 2021 and replacing it with something called SONIA, the Sterling Overnight Interbank Average Rate. Very interesting names. Um, yield on, on money market instruments. So it's very important to understand that concept, yields on money market instrument, because money market uh, money market securities are low risk. So they're not risk free. Why? Because the only thing that's risk free is the US Treasury bill. In theory, the US government can always pay back their money. So we have to be aware of this. The securities of the money market promise yields greater than those default free T bill, at least in part because of the relative greater risk. So the money market, all money market yields greater than the treasury bill. It should because the treasury bill is the safest thing you can have when you give your money to the US government. This is what we started with. You remember the T-bill or the bills? Those are the safest. So, so investors who require more liquidity also will accept lower yields on securities such as as T-bills, so they can be quickly and more cheaply sold for cash. So if you want liquidity, you'll have to accept lower yield. Accepting lower yield means you have T-bill is your best yield. And history shows that that's the case. For example, CDs consistently, consistently certificate of deposit had offered a higher yield than T-bills. So look, okay, consistently, this is the spread between the two. It means the difference between the, the CD, the CD certificate of deposit and the treasury bill rate. Notice in terms of, in times of crisis, it spikes, it spikes, and that makes sense, okay? So, because if you want safety, you go with the, you go with the treasury bill. Otherwise, you know, everything else is less safer, okay? Also, what we, we have what's called the TED spread. Just give, give me one second here. The TED spread is the difference, is the difference that, the, uh, erase this. The, the debt, TED spread, that's another thing that they look at, is the difference, between LIBOR and LIBOR and U.S. Treasury. That's another rate that's that's monitored very closely. And let's look at the TED spread. Also, the TED spread is the kind of show the same thing. When there is riskiness in the market, that spread increase. And that's why in the financial market, they follow the TED spread. When the difference between LIBOR and the treasury rate goes up, when, when the difference between them spread a lot, then it's a risky time. That's, that's, that's an indication of risk. In the next session, we would look at the bonds market. As always, I would like to remind you to connect with me, link, like on LinkedIn, like my lectures, share them. If they benefit you, it means they might benefit other people. And don't forget to visit my website, farhatlectures.com. And of course, stay safe if we are still living through this coronavirus. Good luck and study hard.